Um, thanks again, Paige, and thanks, Maria, for setting this up, and thanks, everyone, for coming out. So my name is Drew Grunewald. I'm an associate professor here at the School for Environment and Sustainability, and I also have an adjunct appointment in civil and environmental engineering. And I'd like to start off with, by showing this slide, um, because I think it underscores um, what we face here in the region from a climate adaptation perspective. There are massive scale climate processes that are affecting the hydrologic cycle in the Great Lakes region, but even more importantly, uh, one of my underlying themes or uh, underlying themes here is that the technology and the tools and the resources we have here in the Great Lakes system to understand the kind of processes you're seeing on that slide can be used all around the world to help improve adaptation to changes in the climate system. Um, and that's one of the underlying themes of my work. So what I want to start off first with here are three key questions that drive the research that I've been working on. Uh, represented by these three slides here. So the one on the left um, deals with the question, how do changes in the climate system propagate into hydrologic response? And this may seem like a relatively straightforward question, but I can guarantee you there's not a straightforward answer and there's not a scientific consensus on this. What this slide is showing, these arrows here, are looking at different fluxes um, coming on off the land surface and how the relationship between those fluxes, particularly latent and sensible heat flux, in combination with precipitation, turn into changes in surface overland flow and there's also groundwater flow. And again, there is not a good scientific consensus on how this works, particularly for large lakes and also for engineered systems. So one of the things we work on here is the idea that in atmospheric models in the atmospheric sciences community, our friends from class, this is a no-brainer. We use latent sensible heat flux models, but in the traditional engineering community, we often use temperature as a proxy for these flux processes. And on climate time scales, that's a problem. It can run into a real imbalance in the water supply when we use these different approaches. So question number one, how does climate change propagate into hydrologic response? Question number two, represented by the middle here, is how do uncertainties in hydrologic models, hydrologic data, affect water management decisions? So we did an awful lot of work over the past decade with the hydropower authorities in the Great Lakes region. And this is an, uh, an aerial photo of Niagara Falls. So on the bottom, you see the sort of iconic horseshoe shape there of the Canadian side of the falls. Um, and then further up, you can see the American Falls. And then way at the top of the image here, you can see one of the reservoirs that stores water to feed the hydropower facilities. And one of the managers of uh, the New York Power Authority came to me about five years ago, and they pointed to a little blip on their graph. And they said, you see that, Drew? We lost millions of dollars that month because we didn't have a good forecast that was reflecting what's happening in the climate system. So second question that I like to look at is, how do uncertainties in these models affect water management decisions? And then on the far right hand um, slide, the third research question has to do with wa uh, future water supplies and to what extent do our assumptions about anthropogenic influences um, change in the different future water supplies? So we have a lot of understanding of or at least we're trying to understand the climate system and the hydrologic system better. But what I'm concerned about with future water supplies is the extent to which our current assumptions about human population and anthropogenic influence might be violated. In the Great Lakes Basin, the big question is, over the next 20 years, are uh, population migration and water demand uh, going to dramatically change and influence long-term water level supplies? Okay. So um, in terms of the tools that I like to use for the research, uh, I'm a modeler, and I like looking at a lot of data sets, but in general, I like to develop two different types of models. On the left-hand side, we're looking at developing process-oriented models. So this is a representation of the Great Lakes Basin starting from the bottom up, where we wanted to develop a, the brand new capability of supporting um, the WERF or weather research forecasting model, in particular, the WERF hydro model, the hydrologic subroutine for that. And to do that, we had to build a brand new representation of the entire Great Lakes Basin. And now we've built WERF hydro on top of that, and now we can use that to develop a whole set of uh, simulations and forecasts. So that's sort of the process-based um, models. And on the right-hand side, I have a slide representing the other type of model we use, which are statistical models. So what this slide is showing here um, is, is what we did using a Bayesian hierarchical model to show how water levels on Lake Superior went from, and you can't really see this red dot here, went from this point right here across a record-setting surge to here. And every single one of these little bars right here represents the relative contribution of precipitation, evaporation, and runoff. And we're able to differentiate those different drivers 
really for the first time, using Bayesian inference and the statistical modeling tools here. In terms of classes, um, I'm hoping to introduce a new course here that focuses on um, the hydrologic cycle from a water resources management and climate change perspective. That's the slide on the left. And the slide on the right takes a look at multivariate analysis. So this is showing the Pacific, the Pacific decadal oscillation and serial autocorrelation within that. It's something that a lot of people don't often account for in their analytics. But that's a class I'd love to introduce here, um, either now or in the near future, for C's. Uh, and then finally, in terms of civic engagement, um, I want to focus in particular on the work that we've done with water levels over the past decade or so. And there was a period in which water levels were sort of at a crisis. In the top panel here, you can see water levels on Lake Superior and Lake Michigan Huron. The dark green is Michigan Huron. The light green is Superior over the past 60 years. Letters A and letters B represent periods where water levels on those systems reached all-time record lows, going back in the record over about 150 years. Regionally, there truly was a crisis, and there was a call by the public to introduce new anthropogenic controls to artificially raise Lake Superior and Lake Michigan Huron. And what we did is we brought science into the civic discussion, and we believe really moved the needle that reduced those calls and convince people that it wasn't water diversions, it wasn't Nestle, it wasn't um, vessels carrying water, it was climate change. So, uh, I'll stop there. Thanks.